Welcome to Marin Talks Money, the podcast in which people who know the markets explain the markets. I'm Marin Somerset Webb. This week, Jim Reed, Global Head of Economics and Thematic Research at Deutsche Bank, joins me to discuss his latest research, which closely examines how US tech stocks have soared. So-called Magnificent Seven American tech giants combined market cap alone would make it the second largest country stock exchange in the world. We talk about whether this level of concentration should be concerning for global stock markets and, of course, for you. And after my conversation with Jim, do stay tuned because Bloomberg columnist John Orthos is joining me for our weekly debrief. Jim, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Right, Jim, I want to start with a note you wrote recently called Everything Points to a Soft Landing Except for History. And what I particularly like about this piece is the very first slide. Percent of Bloomberg articles mentioning soft landing in monthly total articles, it says. And then there's a wonderful chart that says that we tend to mention soft landings a lot just before there isn't one. And then uh, there's another chart underneath that that shows that we love to talk about recessions after they've already started. So they're not charts that really show um, us journalists in, in the best of light. So I wonder if we could start by talking about why it is that uh, we're usually wrong about soft landings and why it is that we may well be this time as well. Not me, by the way, them. It's a fun kind of icebreaker uh, for the pack. I, I suppose if, if you think about it, um, if you've got an economy that's operating in a, a relatively uh, normal manner and then it overheats and then central banks uh, tighten policy to, to remove some of that uh, heat, data will soften. And therefore, as it softens, you probably get more and more people talk about uh, soft landing and the news uh, articles that mention it spike. Uh, and then I suppose you've got a question, is that the final destination or is it just the pathway to um, a harder uh, landing? And I, I suppose the only problem with that graph that I, I put in my piece is that there's only 30, 40 years of data. So you've only really got three or four cycles. Uh, and therefore, you can't base a whole investment thesis on it. But it's interesting that before the last you know, three or four recessions, uh, you have had soft landing talk spike uh, quite aggressively, you know, six to 18 months beforehand. So uh, it has happened in, in those cases. I don't think we can say for certain it's going to happen again. But uh, soft landing uh, is all, has been all the rage in the last two or three months and doesn't necessarily mean we'll have one. Well, let's talk about the case for a soft landing. I mean, in that it is definitely the case still that most people believe that not just the US, but across the board, there will be a soft landing. And even, you know, in the UK recently, we had these numbers uh, dropping us into a, a technical recession. And everyone said, gosh, don't worry. In fact, even uh, Deutsche Bank put out a piece saying, don't panic. It's a short and small technical recession. I, there's no, nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. So what is the, what is the case for a, a global soft landing? Yep, I think the the main case probably rests on uh, inflation falling rapidly enough and making enough progress towards two percent that uh, the central bank can cut rates just in time to stop the lag of policy uh, being too threatening to uh, the economy. And I think that is the key thing. Inflation inflation has fallen quicker than virtually everyone expected over the last twelve. Uh, 12, 15 months, let's say. Even the most bullish on inflation probably didn't see inflation coming down uh, as quickly as it has done. So, And I suppose that the next point is, does it go the last mile uh, towards 2%? Well, this is always the hardest bit, right? The last mile is always the hardest bit. We've had guests on this show over the last year or so who've looked at the, the history of inflation once it's gone to, to double digits or close to double di digits. And there are so many experiences historically in developed economies of that number coming down, maybe, you know, 4%, 5%, but then not being able to get through that last bit. And then quite often you see, you see it rearing its, its, its ugly head again. So getting down to to 5% or 4% even feels like the easy bit. I think that's right. And look, a lot of, a lot of the models do say inflation is going to return to uh, 2% within a reasonable time frame. So that, that would be what the soft landing thesis is, is, is based upon. And that's where I suppose we can have the biggest debate. Is that going to happen this time or, or, or not? But that is definitely what the soft landing thesis is based around. But we have slightly lost our confidence in models, haven't we? Particularly central bank models. 
And I know there's lots of talk about how central bankers and the Bank of England in particular is going to have a good look at their models and improve them and change them, et cetera. But there's not been time for that yet. So they're still using the structures that have been phenomenally wrong for four or five years. No, I think that's right. And I think the um, I, I was shocked at how complacent markets were, you know, two, three years ago about uh, inflation, given you've just seen the biggest money supply spike uh, since World War Two, And actually, if you look at longer term data, you'd have to go back about 150 years uh, to the late 19th century to see a spike uh, in money supply bigger than the one uh, that we saw in, in COVID. So, you know, any anybody that's got any kind of monetary leanings, that, that had to have brought um, proper inflation. Um, so, yeah, the market and uh, the market central banks uh, haven't really uh, covered themselves in glory on inflation in the last um, handful of years. So, uh, you know, one has to take that into account when you when you think about predictions of inflation. Yeah. Do you have monetarist leanings? Because if you do, you have to believe that inflation is going to continue on its way down, right? Because we've seen one of the sharpest sharpest contractions in money supply in a long time. Yep. And um, I, I would say that my biases are that uh, inflation is a monetary uh, phen- phenomena. It's probably a, it's slightly more complicated than that. And I suppose one of the interesting things at the moment is whether you uh, the stock versus the flow. So um, if you were making a case that inflation might linger a little bit longer, you would probably say that the that the stock of money in the system is still big enough from, you know, from that massive helicopter drop two or three years ago, that even though the flow of money is now contracting, so money supply numbers are negative most of the, across most of the important parts of the world, maybe that... Um, stock of money, that reservoir of money from the huge stimulus is still there kind of um, around uh, around the system. So that's where it's confusing, that stock versus uh, flow. And- yeah, and we keep thinking that people's savings are going to run out, that that stock is going to disappear, but but it doesn't, does it? No, and actually in the US where we probably spent a bit more time analysing this, uh, before the revisions to GDP in uh, September, they do annual benchmark revisions, we thought that the stock of excess savings would run out by the end of last year. So, you know, six weeks ago. But um, with the revisions that uh, were seen, our calculations meant that excess savings had another an, another year. So that, that, again, might be one of the reasons why uh, we haven't had a recession yet, because there is that stock of excess savings that uh, lingers from, from the pandemic stimulus. Yeah. And the labour market is still strong pretty much everywhere. Yeah, I mean, the labour market is a lagging indicator, so one has to be careful. But at the moment, the, another big, I, I suppose what most people who believe in the soft landing uh, uh, to the fullest degree think is that, you know, the, the miracle has been that the, the central banks have uh, put the biggest hiking cycle in 40 years into the system uh, and it's, it's dealt with inflation and has had no consequence on unemployment. And that, you'd have to say that's true, but which is whether unemployment is a lagging indicator or, or not. And history says it is. So you shouldn't take too much from that. And are they forgetting the believers in soft landings, just how long the lag of monetary policy can, can be? You know, that everyone for, for the last couple of years has behaved as the central banks put up interest rates and that's that. It happens immediately. But in fact, the lag is, is always very long and conceivably could be longer in this cycle because of the way people fix their debt during the very low interest rate period, right? Yeah. And I mean, we, we did a look at um, the last 13 US hiking cycles uh, over the last 70 years. And um, apart from the Volcker Fed induced recession in the early 80s, the earliest a recession has started after the start of a Fed hiking cycle is 19 months. Uh, I should probably rephrase that and say now the 13 cycles, the Volcker recession happened 11 months after the start of the hiking cycle, but the next earliest was 19 months. Okay, and that, that would take us to when? Uh, that would have taken us to October last year. So, it, it, so a very early recession would have happened in Q4 of last year, basically. And I suppose well, if you look at history, uh, a lot happened kind of between uh, 19 and 30 months, if that makes sense, from the initial um, hiking cycle date. And that means that we're kind of in that window. OK, we're in that window now. E- effectively, yeah. This is where history would say, um, you know, kind of sniper's alley of, um, of, of recessions. Um, 
from a historical point of view is is more probabilistic. And actually, uh, the interesting thing is, twelve months ago, uh, most of the most analysts were thinking you'd get a recession within. You know, we were in a recession or close to it at that point, and that would have been very early historically. Uh, yet nobody now is that worried, even though now uh, probabilistically you're at more risk. Okay, and how worried are you when you when you uh, when you say, "Well, this is happening. Look at history. We always talk about soft landings. This this kind of soft landing data is no different to how it's been in the past. Just before something nasty happens, how how worried are you about the nasty?" Um. If I'm being completely honest, yeah, that's um, what I'm after. Complete say, honesty, Jim, the whole way through. <laughs> only, only between you and us. Yep. Don't tell anybody else. I won't tell anybody else. Um, a- absolutely. If, if I'm being completely honest, we got the inflation call spot on. Uh-huh. Uh huh. We were very early on it. We got the Fed call spot on. We thought they would move very aggressively before anybody else. We've got the recession call wrong so far. Um, um, I thought you'd be in a, a U.S. recession by the end of uh, twenty. 23 so you know a couple of months ago so I, I you know i have to be i have to look at you know the things i've looked at and think whether they're still uh valid um i would say the thing that has probably prevented the recession most has been the excess savings in the system and the fact that companies and entities probably have less borrowing needs than um maybe they would normally have at this stage of the uh, of, of the cycle now both can't last forever so excess savings even if even if we revised our uh, forecast based on the revisions they probably will run out by the end of uh, this year and you know for most consumers sooner than that and there is a refi wall uh, coming in in levered credit and commercial real estate and therefore the, i think again the soft landing narrative probably does need the Fed to be cutting rates this year uh, to to just about get us over the line uh, before we have more difficult times ahead. So we thought you'd be in a recession and you're not. Uh, history would say that the risks are still going to be there uh, for probably the next year. And I suppose the question is, can the Fed cut rates quick enough and aggressive, uh, aggressively enough that you get back to a more normal kind of monetary position before an accident happens. That sounds like a really nasty situation because if if we agree that inflation is still looking a bit dicey and we agree that it may be, as you say, the stock rather than the flow that is keeping inflation a little higher and more volatile than people expected, then it gets very hard for central bankers, maybe not so hard for the Fed with its dual mandate, but certainly hard for the likes of the Bank of England um, to start cutting rates in time for this to happen. The way you describe it, it sounds incredibly precise. And one thing we do know is that monetary policy, it's very hard to make it precise, right? Particularly in this environment. The way I think about it is that in in this uh, last, you know, three, three, four years or so, you've had two forces in the opposite directions of just once in a lifetime size. So you have the kind of the once in the lifetime increase in the money supply uh, on one side, which was just ginormous around the world, uh, and then followed by, um, you know, the biggest hike in interest rates in 40 years and the biggest contraction in money supply for uh, for the best part of 80, 80 years. And to, to think that they can be perfectly calibrated to kind of um, slowly drift you back to 2% inflation and uh, 2% growth, it's not impossible, but it Given the lag of policy, that would also require a lot of good fortune, I think. And look, the Deutsche Bank house view has moved to a a soft landing as being our our central case scenario. And that clearly looks like uh, the most likely scenario at the moment. But I would say that probably the tails of that distribution are bigger than the market expects. So, you know, the no landing scenario is probably a higher risk than the market expects. And I still think the hard landing scenario probability is probably higher than the market expects. Oh, let's talk about the no landing scenario. How does that work? Well, I think the no landing scenario is one where the inflation data just stalls enough that the Fed either can't cut rates or, you know, maybe does a, a, a cut and then has to stop or even contemplates rising again. And I suppose where that would be an issue is if that rates are quite restricted now. So if you look at real rates in uh, across the the world, they're, they're they're pretty restrictive, and therefore, you know, the probability of an accident does 
uh, the, what a cumulative probability of an accident probably increases steadily the longer you have rates at these sort of levels. So that's probably the risk of a no landing. Is there an argument that the uh, central banks are loath to cut interest rates because they're actually quite keen to get rates back to long-term historical levels? Uh, when I say long-term historical, I mean sort of 5,000-year levels rather than 20-year levels. And so in an ideal world, they'd like to be able to stay up at 4% or so. I, I suppose the way I like to think about it is more from the uh, angle that, if, you know, if you listen to central bank speak, you're never more than a, a, a few days away from a central banker mentioned in the 1970s trying to uh, ensure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the 1970s. I mean, the, the unfortunately, the Arthur Burns Fed uh, is not particularly not held particularly well in academic uh, and central bank circles, and therefore most central bankers uh, really don't want their legacy to be that they also made made similar errors. So I think on balance, the the central bank's probably main priority is not to ease too early. It doesn't mean to say that their priority is not to ease uh, if the data is, is, is there. I think ingrained, it's almost like um, every central banker has been to the virtual 1970s open university course. They, they don't want to be seen to be making the same, same mistake. And I think the, the central banks have been saying this, but the markets kind of between October and January weren't listening to them and didn't believe them. And I think in the last you know, last two or three weeks, the markets have kind of stood up and, and kind of taken a little bit of that, that warning. So there's a bit more balance in market pricing now. But yeah, central banks, I mean, if, if the US inflation data of the last week isn't a one-off, then that seriously raises the question of uh, whether the Fed can start a, 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 an Asian cycle or if they do start, how you know, they probably wouldn't get very far. It's interesting. And Everyone I'm talking to at the moment about various things is where everyone's listening to the same uh, The Rest is History podcast about the 1970s, right? Literally, it's, it's at the forefront of everyone's minds. And I reckon central bankers are probably listening to that as, as well and thinking to themselves, God, the last thing I want to be is, is one of the central bankers who got it wrong, particularly haven't got it, got it so wrong for the last four or five years. Everyone wants to be remembered as a Vulcan, not, not a Burns, and that may have impacts for, for all of us. Yeah, listening to the central bankers, they're, they're remaining on the... Um... Uh, cautious side in terms of uh, rate cuts. I, I suppose what the market will still choose to ignore them if they believe that they have a better insight into the data. But um, we've probably moved a bit more in balance in the last few weeks. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at what this idea that we're moving for, from a uh, into a soft landing scenario has meant for markets. Now, you wrote recently about the the magnificent seven, the seven, the seven. Um, companies in the US that are effectively driving US markets and in driving US markets, driving global markets, because the US is such a big component of the global market. So we have these seven companies that are basically uh, the drivers behind our, our pensions, our ISAs, our, uh, our assets. What is going on with them? The US market is now what nearly as concentrated as it has ever been in history with these big companies taking up most of the market. And time after time after time, we look at them, we say, this can't go on. This is ridiculous. This never ends well. But maybe it is going to end well. Well, the first thing to say is I wish I did have them in my eyes. Uh, I, I, uh, with all due respect, I wouldn't be speaking to you. I'd be on the beach. Um, if I'd have had them hey, in must, my eye. You must have some of them in your eye. So you must have a nice global tracker or something. And uh, Deutsche must have given you a nice pension, which auto enrolled you into some lovely US trackers. Surely. Maybe in those decisions that I haven't had anything to do with, uh, maybe there's a little bit um, in, in, the, in the back burner. That's how it works for me as well, Jim. If I've got any, it's not a decision I made. Yeah, sadly, sadly for both of us. Um, look, I think um, they are ast uh, astonishing. Uh, in terms of their their size and their their breadth, so the the U.S. market is pretty much the most concentrated it's been in history, really. Uh, very similar to the where where it was in 1929, uh, in terms of uh, the weight of uh, let's say the top five uh, constituents. Uh, so the top five make up about 25 percent of the market now. So that that's as big as it as it has been in in, in history. I uh, look at, as an economic historian. I have a bias to believe that this is nonsense and doesn't make sense and is warning of us uh, of, a, of a more difficult time uh, to come. Yeah, I suppose this is where you've got to be slightly careful of 
of, of history because we've probably never had a situation in history where um, the companies that make up that top 5% or the Magnificent Seven, et cetera, make as much money already. You know, this isn't like 2000 where there was – uh, a, a lot more speculation in companies that that weren't profitable, and just you know, a, a, a stat to throw out out at you: um, if the Magnificent Seven were a stock market on their own, if you exclude the US, they'd be the third biggest stock market in the in the world by profitability. So only China and Japan uh, would be ahead of them. Yeah, and they'd be the biggest by market cap. I saw as well in 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 your work. So they would be the that those seven alone. Uh, would be in taking out the rest of the US would be the biggest stock market in the world. China coming just behind them, Japan just after that, then India, France, etc. And then you have individual US companies, uh, Microsoft, Apple, which are bigger as single companies in terms of market cap than the, than all of the UK market, all of the Canadian market, all of the German market. I mean, it's just nuts. It is, and as I said, my natural inclination to say this this is crazy. And then you look at how much money they make, and it is still expensive and elevated, but it starts to become, you can start to build a narrative of some description. So, for example, the amount of annual profit that our Apple makes is around 60% of the entire listed stock market in France. Yeah, no, I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. I've got, I've got your, your chart in, in front of me, which, uh, so if you look at it in terms of uh, billions for the profits, uh, Apple 101, uh, all of the UK, all of it, 217. Um, all of Canada, 136. Um, all of Germany, 188. And then you go to Alphabet. Alphabet alone, 74. Amazon alone, 30, etc. Meta alone, 30. It was absolutely extraordinary how successful these companies are. And as you say, once you start to look at it like that, maybe these valuations are okay. Individually within the seven, there may be some that are, uh, look a little bit more stretched than others. But uh, I mean, if you're talking about you know, the likes of Apple and Microsoft, you know, these are very profitable companies that probably will stay profitable for a period of time. I'm not, uh, I'm not a micro analyst and I don't uh, understand the widgets, uh, et cetera. Uh, but I, I would say as a minimum that these aren't uber crazy valuations. It's just whether you think that they are rich or not. Mm. Well, they are still high. I mean, if you look at the average of the seven, again, I'm looking at, at your charts, the average, uh, trailing P for those seven stocks is 37 times. I mean, it is high. It's not 100. You know, this is not Japan in the middle of its great bubble, but it's still high. And then, you know, the the, the most expensive NVIDIA on, on 90. And then you come back to the UK as a whole and it's got an, a, an average PE of 17. So they're, they're expensive, but not as expensive as we've seen in, in previous bubbles. Yeah, I think that's probably uh the the way to put it and i suppose if you were trying to put it into a historical context as uh, as well in this era we live in today we probably have more uh globalization that allows companies to cross borders maybe more than it was let's say the nifty 50 or in the, obviously people talk a lot about the nifty 50 in the late 60s early 70s um although the companies sold products around the world the, the world was um uh, much more localized back then. So, uh, you know, Kodak, for example, uh, although it was a global company, wouldn't have the same kind of global presence as um, some of the Magnificent Seven uh, t t today. Um, the internet has also kind of um, been a global phenomena and therefore, you know, the likes of Magnificent Seven can access global consumers in a, uh, you know, a press of a button in the way that maybe we couldn't have done 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Uh, etc. So the world has, has changed a little bit to allow dominance of individual companies more than they would have in, in the past. But it's just what price you're, what you want to pay for that. Yeah, and there is risk. And we talk about globalization being one of the big drivers behind these, these companies. And of course, it has been. But one of the things we're looking at now is a, a degree of deglobalization. And it's never going to happen as fast as some people believed it would. But this is this is not the world of five years ago. It's very different world. And there are a lot of governments out there that are increasingly controlling the internet and increasingly want to control the way these these big companies operate and in particular control their, their profits and how those profits are taxed uh, and to control the, the information that they can carry or not carry. So there's still a lot of risk there when you think about geopolitics, right? Yeah, no, and it's a good point. And look, if you, if you think about markets, I mean, we make, we make the point in the report that the top five biggest companies over 
in, in the US, for example, do change over time and in fairly unpredictable ways that you wouldn't have known maybe five, 10 years in advance. They, they, they tend to be quite stable in the short term, but quite they, they move quite a bit in the medium term, if that makes sense. So, you know, the, the top five biggest companies in 10 years may be a completely different cohort. And because of things that we don't know yet, so we don't know if globalization is going to really cause a, 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 a kind of a schism in the world order at some point in this decade. You know, we don't know if, if there's a new silver bullet that's going to come around that makes some of the technologies redundant. We, we just don't know. And that's part, you know, part of investing is obviously trying to uh, lean against things that you don't know uh, if, if the price is, is probably the wrong price. And that, that's, a, that's a skill that probably helps you in the long term, but doesn't necessarily help you in the short term. Yeah, shorter term, though, I suppose we could say that these are all growth companies. So it is the expectation that rates will fall reasonably soon that has been one of the drivers. I mean, obviously, it's AI and uh, and this kind of thing. But it, it's also uh, the idea that rates will fall. And that's obviously good for, for growth companies. So if we do see rates not falling as expected, may we see a sudden turn in the Magnificent Seven? Or is that too simplistic? Well, I think if you'd have said that to me six, nine, 12 months ago, I, I would have agreed. But we've had um, some concern about rates in the last month or so. And actually, it's the smaller stocks that have suffered. So the Russell 2000 has it, been much more sensitive to the rate um, volatility that we've seen in the last few weeks, whereas the Magnificent Seven have just powered on. So it, it seems like you know, the, the Magnificent Seven investors have said, look, under any macro scenario now, we think these are going to win. But if uh, the Fed is going to raise rates, oh, that's not very good for the small caps in the US, uh, etc. So I, I think your proposition is a, a fairly sensible one. But in, in recent weeks and recent months, it seems to be that uh, they are decoupling from that rate expectation. Now, whether that can last is a, a, a moot point, but for now, they, they are. Yes, they're basically de decoupled from everything. They've moved into their own little world beyond our world. Beyond our comprehension, a bit like uh, AI. They, they are, yeah, they, they, they have um, superior intelligence to us, I think. Okay, so you're not going to rush out after our chat and buy more of these things for your ISA. <laughs> Sorry, some of these things for your ISA. I, I am confused about it. I, I, in doing this report, I really learned how great these, most of these companies are. Uh, I, I genuinely, you know, I've been doing this job a long time and I look at these stocks as a macro man all the time, but I genuinely learn a lot about how great these companies are from a, a profitability uh, basis. And it was really instructive to compare that to whole countries' uh, stock markets, mate. Whether I'd want to pay up for that, I, I'm always somebody who likes to see a bargain rather than uh, pay up for something on the expensive side. Even if that is the wrong uh, trade, I, I tend to try to be a bit of a bargain hunter. Yeah, I'm with you there, Jim. And look, and look where that's got us, eh? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let's talk about other markets then. I mean, one of the things that we can see so clearly in the in your charts about the Magnificent Seven is just how lowly some of these European markets and the UK market in particular are, are valued at the moment relative to the US market. I mean, obviously, if you take the Magnificent Seven out of the US market, it's not nearly as expensive as it is with them included. But nonetheless, there's still a, a US premium in there. And when we look at the UK, which we do relentlessly on this podcast, because John and I are both both have a value bias that we, we can't shake. Uh, when we look at the UK, we keep thinking, well, surely that, that's the place to be. That's the place to be. Uh, is that a market that looks attractive to you? As someone that likes a value, then it, it's hard to say the UK is, is, bad, is bad value. I do think there's a legacy problem. I think there's a fair proportion of international investors that have kind of sidestepped the UK post-Brexit. Um, and that has left um, the, the market relatively uh, cheap. I suppose the one thing you say about the UK, I've, I've talked at length about how concentrated uh, the US market is. But I just looked actually earlier, uh, the top five names in the FTSE make up about 32% of it. So I appreciate that's the FTSE 100 rather than the S&P 500. So not quite the same. But it's, it is a, the UK market has always been concentrated to kind of banks and commodities. And therefore, that there is a, a little bit of healthcare, and there's obviously a little bit of what goes on in those sectors probably overrides things. But do you think that the numbers coming out of both Europe and the UK are beginning to suggest to foreign investors that while the UK isn't exactly in, in the best of health, there's no no 
obvious um, indication in the numbers that we're doing significantly worse than the rest of Europe. So at some point you have to look at it and say, well, I need to, I need to get over myself about this Brexit business and just look at things as, as they are. I definitely think you're seeing that a little bit from my conversations I have with people around the, the world. It probably needs a bit of momentum to, to get it going. It's a bit like M&A. You know, once, once you get maybe a couple of big deals for overseas uh, companies buying, you know, cheap UK companies, maybe there'll be a bit more activity. And maybe for that, you need the interest rate environment to be a bit more stable uh, across the world. But uh, yeah, I think, look, I think the UK market does look pretty, pretty good, good value. Uh, I've I've always liked dividends and you get quite a bit of dividends in the UK market. We keep saying to people, John and I, you know, there's a lot of cheap equities listed in the UK. And if you don't buy them, eventually somebody else will. And, uh, you know, here we are with Curry's Curry's earlier this week. Obviously, a deal hasn't been done yet. But, uh, you know, it will be beginning to see these these companies that have done nothing but see their share prices fall for years and are trading on very low valuations with potential. They are starting to get snapped up. And we keep wondering just how many of them have to get snapped up before other investors look at the market and go, yeah, that'll do me. From reading your work, you look at this a lot more closely than me. So I, I would bow to your kind of um, expertise here. But Excellent. That's the kind, that's the kind of guest we like. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, from, from a macro point of view, it, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with the kind of conclusions you come with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think we we do keep looking at it, but uh, John and I don't entirely agree on that. We'll have to have another another conversation on that one. Um, I did want to ask you about um, if you were if you were coming into government now as a new chancellor in the UK, what would you do? Given your knowledge of economic history and your knowledge of how the UK works, what would you do to make things better? I think if I was chancellor uh, and I came in with a a, a clean. Uh, slate. Look, we're in a difficult situation in uh, the decades ahead because we do have um, a lot of uh, entitlements that we have uh, promised people that, that means the pressures on uh, government coffers are going to go up and up. So I think you have to try to find ways of extending people's working lifetime in a way that is politically tenable. Uh, and I'm I don't, not sure I know how to do that, but I think uh, to be a success as a chancellor, you need to try to find ways of um, uh, of doing that. And I think you probably also need to find ways of um, borrowing money that you can invest to make the economy uh, better. Um, and although I'd like to pay lower taxes, um, maybe maybe that's not always the answer. Maybe in some cases it's the answer. But you've got to find ways of making what are still quite low long-term real rates work for you as an economy. And then, look, government debt borrowing, there shouldn't be one hard and fast rules. It probably should be how attractive it is to borrow. So in, in areas where rates and real rates are very, very low, government should be incentivized to borrow in, in ways that they can uh, productively increase the economy. If rates are high, real rates are high, then government shouldn't, you know, should be quite frugal. Uh, so I think you have to have an element of flexibility. I still think real rates are relatively low enough that you can borrow more than what might look to be prudent if you're investing it in the right things. Now, listen, there is one thing that I do have to ask you about. I do have to ask you about before we can finish up here. And I know that neither of these things will be your area of expertise, but we don't care. We just want an answer. We ask everybody if we were going to lock them away somewhere for 10 years. Um, well, be somewhere nice, by the way. Can, can I leave my kids at home? Can I put, leave the kids somewhere else? Yes, you can. You can. Yeah, thank Although you. We're, we're, um, the entire audience is already judging you for that, but you can. <laughs> you can. Um, and then once you're in this lovely place, before you go, sorry, you have to invest all your money, every penny, in one of two things, either gold or Bitcoin. And you don't have to tell us why you make the choice you're about to make, although it's nicer if you do. But what would it be, do you think? I, I would say gold. And I think the reason I would say that, look, I, I'm, I'm someone that's broadly an inflationist. I, I, as an economic historian, I know that inflation is always there because in, in democracies and the election cycles, there is always going to be incentive to create money you know, at some point relatively soon, even if the macro models don't suggest there will be inflation, there will always be a political reason to create inflation, especially in a in a world post uh, Bretton Woods system where fiat money rules. So I'm always an inflationist. So therefore, I, I do like things that 
protect you against inflation. Now, to be fair, gold isn't a brilliant hedge um, for a lot of history, apart from if you've got inflation. So to, to make gold work, you'd actually do need in, inflation. Um, Bitcoin, I, I do think that in a world where we're moving into a, a, a digital uh, world, there will be kind of some digital demand for uh, store of value. I just don't know if Bitcoin is that long term winner. Uh, or whether the regulators will um, deal with it in a different way than they they have today. So I, I wouldn't say Bitcoin is a total um, a disastrous investor investment. I just don't know whether it's the winner, and I don't whether know whether the regulators will um, clamp down on it in years to come. Uh, I would prefer gold. Okay, that puts you in uh, firmly in the. Marin Talks Money pod podcast majority. Is that, a good, is that a good thing? I don't know. We'll find out, won't we, in a decade. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Very kind. Pleasure. Uh, lovely to be invited. Thank you. With me now to reflect on what we just heard from Deutsche Bank's Jim Reed is fellow Bloomberg columnist John Authors. John, you are kind to join us today. It's a pleasure, Marin. Now, I know that you've known Jim for a long time and you've been reading his work for a long time. Yes. When you listened to him speaking today, did you think to yourself, oh, that man is absolutely right. I agree with everything he says. Is that, is that how you felt? Uh, I'm not sure I agree with everything uh, he says, but uh, in general, he's one of the people who thinks in a very similar way to me. Uh, and that means that he's occasionally been too bearish, just as I have been uh, over over the the last couple of decades. Um, but uh, in general, I think you're in pretty safe ground following him. Um, he's got a, an incredibly acute sense of history, which I think is always very important. And he has the rare ability to combine big picture thinking. Well, you heard that in the, the conversation with extremely granular, nerdy focus on on data and it's unusual to have somebody who can who can actually do both equally well okay that said that's uh that's pretty positive mm. now we talked a lot about something that i've written about a lot and i know you've written about a lot which is the concentration in the u.s market the magnificent seven and you know his statistics on this are just absolutely extraordinary that report on on the magnificent seven about them there uh, in terms of market cap and profits being more like countries than companies was wonderful but of course it rings every warning bell in the book for bears like him and me and you right we look at that and we don't go isn't this wonderful it's going to last forever we love this we look at it and we go oh my god this guy's going to fall in Yes, and and but we also have this painful thought that it's gonna it's gonna look really embarrassing until it turns because I just cannot cannot justify jumping in at this level and that's going to look bad for a while. Mm. Well, Jim Jim said that as well, not in his eye, sir. <laughs> as it happens, as it happens, at the at the precise moment we are we're recording this. Uh, about an hour after trading started on, in New York on um, on Thursday. So my factoid for you is uh, after an hour of trading following its results coming out, NVIDIA's market cap is up something like $240 billion. The total market cap of Intel is $180 billion. So our response to the uh, news, the results that, that NVIDIA have, have announced is to decide that they are more than a whole Intel's worth more valuable than we thought they were. Um, which <laughs> And also one of our other colleagues said um, that it was also equivalent to the entire market capitalization of Greece. That's, that would make sense, which interestingly, according to a chart from uh, Jim Reed, uh, Thank you, Jim. Uh, our hero, our hero, Greece is now, now that Japan has managed to take out its all time high, poor old Greece is now in the lead for the uh, uh, stock market that's gone the longest since its last all time high. Oh, interesting. And Greece, Greece is going and to, Cyprus. Yeah, Greece is going to turn into the measurement of stock market units, isn't it? Like Wales is the measurement of <laughs> the scale of everything in the UK. It's yes. five Wales, there's two Wales, there's one Wales, etc. We're now going to say it's worth five Greases, 10 Greases, 45 Greases. It's all a little shame because Greece has hit bottom and is now turning into one of the one of the safer places to invest in in Europe, which is just as well after all the pain it had to get through, go through to get 
where it is now, but in terms of how far away it is from it, its high and how long ago it is, it's got a lot of sledding to go. It's the yeah, it's in many ways comparable to Japan. Anyway, sorry, Jim. Well, let's stick with Japan because, okay, there's there's not much point in us talking much longer about how wonderful we think Jim is and how he's absolutely right on everything. Goodness me, what a man. So why don't we talk about the other thing that you and I are both fascinated by, which is Japan and the new high in Japan, which we've been waiting for a long, long time. You know, I started my career in Japan back when the Nikkei was roughly where it is now, you know? And uh, I've been writing for a decade telling our, our readers that, you know, it's going to turn, it's going to turn. It's, it's really, it's going to turn. It's definitely going to turn. There's a new high out there. Um, and now it's finally happened. And you wrote a column about... Yes, Goto yeah, has arrived. You wrote a column yeah. about this this morning. And you think, you think this can continue, right? Not over yet. More new, more new highs ahead. A new high every day. I, I, I don't know that I would, I would say that. This is definitely a more solid high, uh, a, a more of a foundation for further gains than the last one, which is one of the safest comments I have ever made in my life. No, but this isn't why true. we ask you on, John. Uh, Going to have to raise your game. No, no, no. So, so uh, if you want just to continue the, uh, you know, the Japanese stock markets, the, their, their part in my downfall or whatever, my first ever day at work for the Financial Times was January the 1st, 1990, and the Nikkei had topped the day before. So this is the first all-time high I have ever witnessed in Japan in my 34 and a half, 34 years in, uh, in financial journalism. So yep, yeah, this, this is a very big deal. I, I do think in this case, um, what matters is that uh, corporate Japan has sorted itself out in a way that wasn't true before. Uh, in terms that Jim Reed would approve of very greatly, if you, despite having been at such low levels for such a long time in terms of interest rates, there are far fewer zombie companies in Japan than there are in the States. Um, for all that Japan's growth has been slower, um, a lot of Japanese companies haven't actually um, taken the opportunity of low rates to just continue their e existence. There has been some degree of necessary pain and consolidation. And the reforms that really got going over a decade ago as part of Arbenomics to, to improve corporate governance, to persuade Japanese companies to be nice to their shareholders are beginning to have an effect. They're buying back stock in a way they've never done before. Their dividends are going up. Um, so that's on the on the fairly boring level. I, I do think if you're a value investor, if you if you if you're caring about the longer term, I think Japan still looks like a fairly decent bet. If we then want to get into the macro surrounding central banks, what might happen to the yen, where the Bank of Japan goes next, then there's all kinds of very significant risks we could discuss. We can talk about that as well, but but you also put you put a lovely chart in in your column this morning uh, from Sokjian showing that um, projections for two thousand and four two thousand and five earnings per share have fallen across the world, with the sole exception of Japan, and it's a great short a great chart because over the last however many decades decades every time we look at a chart where something about Japan is the sole exception, it's been in a bad way. All right, so to see a chart where it's uh, Japan is unique and special, but in a really good way. It's kind of exciting. More, again, it's, this is why we don't retire, why we carry on doing our jobs. There are actually, every so often, there's something you've never seen before comes up. But yes, exa exactly. Like, like the macro trends are such that I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't say, yes, definitely stick with, stick with Japan, fill your boots, because there are macro risks. But in terms of the, the kind of... Uh, investing that is somewhat out of fashion, but which both of us have spent a long, long careers encouraging people to do, um, the actual companies you're buying and the cash flows they are trying to generate for you that you buy when you buy their stock do actually seem to be in a fundamentally much healthier place than they have, have been in decades. And um, you know, that is relative to Japan being a disaster for a long time. I'm not saying that proves they're better value than X, Y, Z, other other countries, but it certainly suggests that Japan is no longer the negative exception you've really got to be careful about. It's got well-managed, you know, 
companies like Sony may, aren't as exciting as they used to be, but they've never gone away. The Japanese, the, yeah, the Japanese car makers never went away, uh, and and so on. There, 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 there are opportunities there. And do you think that Japan has also taught us something about GDP and how to look at GDP? Because everyone looks at Japanese GDP. GDP growth and says, oh, it's awful, this is terrible. But no one ever takes into account the fact that Japan has a, a static or falling population and therefore its GDP per head is really, really just fine. Whereas we have our own GP looks like it's, it's uh, growing at, well, not exactly reasonable levels, but you know, growing. Um, but our GDP per head is absolutely shocking. Exactly. It's, it's, it's that, that is a very important point. I mean, again, it's one of the standard negative points and with some reason on Japan that it has this aging demographic but yes you looking around Tokyo I, I don't know some of the re, the regions of Japan looking around Tokyo and you do not it it's nothing remotely like a place that's been in a slump for a quarter of a century it's an exciting buzzing place where people obviously still have a very very pleasant standard of living and um uh, I think yes, that that is quite quite easily easily forgotten. It's it, uh, you're not buying the country. I suppose if you're buying a domestic Japanese stock, if the population is going down, that that's some kind of a limit on their their growth. But 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 generally speaking, you're 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 buying a a, a country that uh, has continued to to have one of the highest living standards in the world and has continued to have a very large economy and that's that's uh, it, it, you allowing allowing the uh, the population to to uh, to skew your judgment is a is is a mistake i agree with you mm. and possibly a lot to teach the rest of us about aging populations and how to manage them Beginning Gosh, now to suddenly Japan is way. perfect, right? Suddenly this country can do no wrong. <laughs> look, we're praising it to the skies, they can do everything. Yes. The other thing that's interesting about Japan that has changed over the years um, is that at this point, Korea is the other example of this, but Japan is cool. Uh, my kids are in their teens. They are fascinated by Japan. They're fascinated by manga. They're fascinated by anime, J-pop. All of this stuff is exciting and interesting to them. Um, and uh, you know they are envious when I go to you know not that I go to Tokyo or anything like as much as I would like to but you know I have to have shopping lists with stuff to bring back because they are so fascinated by everything Japanese that wasn't true at all in my from what I recall when Japan was last at its high we all had to go around with a Sony Walkman or whatever but it wasn't as though you know Japan was sort of enviably powerful and rich then it wasn't cool it wasn't exciting and it, it it's cultural uh significance has grown quite significantly during the years uh that its economy has gone off the boil you could incidentally see some parallel there with our own country britain you know the 1960s and 70s were not a great time for the british economy but the beatles and david bowie or whatever it it, it became a much cooler place a much more interesting cultural place uh, during the worst years of uh, worst economic years for for Britain, and arguably something similar might have been going on in Japan. Do I think Britain is cool? <laughs> I, I, I'm a little too out of contact with it. I, um, generally speaking, generally speaking, my, my my gauge for this is 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 where my kids are on things. They are fascinated by the Beatles and the Bowie not just my influence. I don't think they're so fascinated by Dua Lipa uh, or whoever else we would say was the... Okay, the, so the there, big, we can't, we can't Sheeran, hope maybe. that there'll be a, a cool Britannia trigger for the UK market to suddenly oh, well, uh, join the, the Japanese the Harry market in this. Harry Styles. If Harry Styles, if he could get back together with Taylor Swift, that could transform the, uh, the country. If he could actually write a song about how wonderful it is to be back with Harry, then... Uh, then uh, that that probably is the catalyst. That, that at that point you fill your boots with the uh, fill your boots with the footsie. Absolutely, um, fantastic. Well, do you know what? You've heard it here first. <laughs> Keep an eye on Harry Styles. Yes. We've been looking for a catalyst <laughs> for the UK market for a couple of years now. That could be it. John, thank you so much. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to this week's Marin Talks Money. We'll be back next week. In the meantime, if you like our show, rate, review and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And of course, tell your friends about us. And finally, we have our show email. So send along ideas, questions or comments to merinmoney at bloomberg.net. This episode was hosted by me, Marin Somerset Webb. It was produced by Samasadi, additional editing by Blake Maples and special thanks to Jim Reed and to John Authors.